screen. Okay, so it's great pleasure to have Suji Ashok uh, from Chennai. He's going to tell us about the surface defects from fractional brains. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Satoshi, for uh, giving me this chance to present my work. Um, so, as she said, I'm going to talk about surface defects from fractional brains. So, so the idea is to realize uh, book of written defects in string theory. So, one second. So this is work done with my collaborators from Italy, Marco Billo, Maria Luisa Frau, Alberto Lerda, at uh, Fermin from Torino, and my student Sujay Mahato from Math Science. Um, so th these, this work appeared in two of these papers. Um, the first one deals with the simplest type of defect, and this is what I'll focus on for most of the talk. And at the end, I'll make a few comments about the more general case. Um, so let me, let me start with a brief outline of what I'm going to do. So I'll start with a, with a review of what gukov witten defects are in n equals four superangulus theory. And then I will uh, try to introduce the setup in which we work, which is uh, to consider fractional Lee-3 brains on a C2 mod ZM type obifold. And this is the setup that was introduced by Kano Tachikawa way back in 2010. And what I'll do for the, for the let's say half of the talk is to give an overview of the main ideas, which means I'll just try to uh, use pictures and words to try to explain what the main idea is. And the second half of the talk, I'll try to focus on how we implement these ideas. And the, the, and the main tool we use will be just super string perturbation theory. So we'll compute some simple disk amplitudes on the world sheet in this obifold background in the presence of d brains. And then at the end, I'll try to explain how from these uh, open closed disk amplitudes, uh, we can recover the known properties of the surface defects in n equals four. Okay, so that's the broad outline. So I'll begin with my review next. All right, so surface defects are co-dimension two defects in gauge theories. So in four dimensions, it means that these are like uh, two-dimensional surfaces. Uh, so, so they are higher dimensional generalizations of Wilson and the two line defects in gauge theories. And just as line defects have been very useful in um, trying to uh, uncover uh, or, ex or explain the phase structure of gauge theories and they serve as order parameters, the hope is that uh, a detailed understanding of surface defects will also help us do the same and give more input and more understanding of the gauge theory. So we'll, we'll focus on these surface defects in the simplest or the most uh, supersymmetric version of the gauge theory, which is n equals four, and we'll stick to the gauge group UN, okay? So the topology of the surface defect is just a two plane in four dimensional space. Um, so if, if you look at the figure, you can, you can see that I've represented R4 by this two dimensional plane, and the defect is just a line in this, you know, is a complex line in this two dimensional complex space. So in, in whatever follows, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to use Z as the uh, transverse coordinate of the defect, okay? So Gukov and Witten introduced these defects as monodromy defects. So let me try to explain what that means. So here, here I've shown the transverse Z plane to the defect. So the defect is this red dot in this transverse plane. Uh, and R and theta are just the polar coordinates in this two plane. And what, 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 they, what they showed was that this defect has the, is, is such that the four dimensional gauge fields have the following profiles as you approach the location of the defect. So near the defect, uh, one of the complex scalars of n equals four phi has a simple pole in this Z coordinate. And the gauge field uh, takes the following form. So this gauge field is equivalent to a field strength that corresponds to a delta function localized at uh, Z equals zero. So there's a sort of a singular gauge configuration for uh, both the gauge field and, the, and one of the complex scalars of n equals four. And this profile defines the defect. So in the case of UN gauge theory, let me try to explain in more detail this alpha, beta, gamma, R. So here I've written out alpha, beta, and gamma in the matrix form. Uh, you see that the, so this d theta and one by two z is what I just said earlier. So alpha, beta, and gamma really are a set of real numbers, of m real numbers in this case. And, and this uh, profile corresponds to a breaking of the gauge group at the location of the defect 
to this subgroup. So UN breaks to this uh, direct product gaze group at the location of the defect. And each of these blocks are NI by NI identity matrix. Okay, I, so I, I, I hope this is clear. Here, here I just sort of said in a compact way what alpha, beta, gamma are. Here I'm showing in detail for a generic surface defect, the gauge group is broken to this product form at the location of the defect. And there are some parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, which are real parameters that describe the singularity. Any, any questions at this point? Okay, let me go on with the review. So the defect, as I said, is specified by a partition of N. So these Ns, in these, the dimension of these matrices add up to N capital N, the rank of the gauge group. And the parameters alpha, beta, gamma specify the singularity of the gauge field in the scalar at the location of the defect. Okay. Now, because the defect is two dimensional uh, in four dimensional gauge theory, you're allowed to have one other set of parameters um, in the description of the defects. So in the path integral, where you have these kind of singular profiles for the gauge field and scalar, one is allowed to introduce a sort of two-dimensional theta term along the defect. And you can do that for each U and I factor of the unbroken gauge group at the defect. So this introduces another set of M parameters, which I've denoted eta. So the sort of one line summary of the Gukov Hidden defect is that it is characterized by a discrete set of parameters ni, which are the, uh, the, the ranks of the unbroken part of the gauge group by the defect. And we have four M parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and eta, that describe both the singular profiles of the gauge field and scalar, and also this sort of 2D theta angle uh, along the defect, okay? So there's one other thing I'd like to describe in the, in the review, and that is uh, um, the non-perturbative s duality symmetry that exists for n equals four. So n equals four has, a, has the modular group as a 2z as a non-perturbative s duality group. And what Kukam can show in their paper is that uh, these parameters have a particular transformation under the action of the s duality group. So alpha and eta, they essentially transform as a row vector under this general SL2Z group element. And uh, beta and gamma are just rescaled by this uh, factor where tau is the complexified gauge coupling of the four dimensional theory. Okay, so this, this sort of concludes whatever we want to uh, uh, sort of reproduce about the defect from the string theory construction. So if you have any questions about this, uh, this is a good moment to ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll just carry on. Okay. Okay, so the, so the goal, as I said at the very beginning, is to embed or to, to realize this uh, surface defect in string theory. And what, what I mean by this is to derive the profiles of the gauge field and the scalar using some string perturbation theory. And what, what we'll do is to engineer this gauge theory and defect using fractional brains in type 2B string theory. So we'll introduce D3 brains to realize the n equals 4 theory in type 2B string. And we'll use the, we'll realize the defect by using this, by, by using an obvious relation. And at the very end, we'll check our proposal by, uh, by showing that our identification of the various parameters is sort of consistent with this transformation under S duality, um, as that, that, that I just uh, showed you a slide earlier. Okay, so I saw, I hope that the goal of the, uh, the talk is clear. So you, you only focus on 40n equal to 4. 40n equal to 4, that's right. So, okay, so the, the 16 supercharges. Sorry. Uh, yes, 16 okay. supercharges. Okay, okay, exactly. okay. Exactly. Okay, good. Uh, so the basic setup is, uh, I mean, this, the idea for the setup goes back to this paper by Kano and Tachikawa back in 2010 who considered stacks of uh, D3 brains, NI stacks of D3 brains. So these NIs are the same NIs that uh, were the discrete parameters of the defect on this OB4. So they considered um, a sort of singular limit of the ALE space, this C2 mod ZM type OB4. But the interesting thing was that the uh, D brains were not completely transverse to the OB4 two of the directions of the D3 brain were along the OB4. So here I've shown the 
D3 brain in blue and uh, the orbifold in yellow. So the, 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 the green directions have both of them present. So the, the, the complex two plane that the C2 is part of the D3 brain world volume that is along the orbifold. Okay, I, I hope this point is clear. And such configurations uh, were not usually considered in the 90s literature, although there are some references who do discuss this. So I've, I've denoted these K parallel and K perpendicular to, to indicate that these parallel directions are, I mean, along the defect, and these perpendicular directions are transverse to the defect. So the defect we'll see will be, will be along the first uh, complex plane. Okay, so I hope this setup is clear. And I just not key because you're allowed to have momentum mode for the open strings along the D planes along both these directions. Okay, so I hope the setup is clear. I have an orbifold along two and three and a D brain along one and two. Okay. Okay, so let, let's try to uh, re, uh, recapitulate what Kanita Chikawa did with this configuration. So they were interested in computing the partition function of the gauge theory in the presence of a surface defect. So they were not only considered D3, but they also considered D minus one brains. And they, what they did was to compute the moduli action uh, for this configuration. So they, they, they considered all open strings with at least one end on the D minus one, and they wrote an effective action for this um, resulting theory. And they found that it was an orbifold of the usual ADHM moduli action. And, they, uh, and by using omega deformation and so on, they managed to construct the um, partition function or the incident partition function in the presence of this defect. Now, I should, I should say that uh, the, there was this work by Jiang and Mikrosov where they related this, they sort of related this orbifold constructions to other constructions of uh, surface defects using coupled 2D, 4D systems and so on. But I, I will not have anything to say about that. In, in, in fact, we, we will never consider D incidents at all. What we plan to do was to just take this picture of uh, Kanata Chikawa seriously. We just take D3 brains on the orbifold and we ask the question, can we recover the profiles of the gauge field and scalar that I showed you at the very beginning from this D brain setup? Okay. So profiles for the open strings mean that there must be some sort of uh, source for these open string fields or one point functions. And since the defect is sort of realized by the orbifold, uh, it's natural to assume that this must be because of some states that are uh, particular to the orbifold. Uh, and the states that are you know, there for the orbifold and not for the flat space theory are these twist sector states. So what, we, what our idea was, was to cons consider um, turning on constant background values for the twist sector states and then check if the open string fields of the D3 brains uh, are, are induced a profile or not. So we want to check if there is any, any sort of uh, source for these open string fields in the presence of some background values for the twisted sector scalars. Okay. Uh, so to be more precise, what we do is to cons construct exactly like Kanata Chikawa did, sort of NI stacks of fractional D3 brains of type I, and see how they couple to the closed string scalars in the twisted sectors. And in particular, we'll compute these kind of open closed correlators where we insert uh, a twisted scalar B in the, in, on, on the disk and see if there is a non-trivial uh, open closed correlator with any of the open string fields. Okay, so, so, the, so the disk diagram with a constant background value for this um, uh, twisted scalar is, is what acts as a source uh, this, this was what we show eventually, what acts as a source for the open string field. Okay, and we will see that this correlator can be computed, this correlator is non-zero, and um, this indeed gives rise to the right profile one would expect for a gucker defect. So, Sorry, let's when, try to when, see. When you yes. say, I have a question. So, when you say fractional brain, uh, D3 brain, what is fractional about it? So, by the way, you have brains on orbifolds. They, uh -huh. if, you, if you look at the um, uh, consistent D brains, you can define on the theory. Uh -huh. they, they, so you are, you are allowed to have fractional charges. Oh, so I see. In, right? Uh, if you have a ZM orbifold, you can have one end yeah. of the charge of the uh -huh. regular brain. Uh -huh. So the okay. regular brain can move away from the fixed point in the usual transverse case, but the fractional brains are stuck to the orbifold fixed point. Okay. 
And it, so about this this figure, so this figure is about worksheet, worksheet? Yes, yes. Okay. So we are doing, so we, we, we will construct a boundary uh -huh. state for these rational D3 brains. Uh -huh. And using this boundary state um, formalism, uh -huh. we compute uh, the correlation function between one closed string and one open string uh, field in the presence uh -huh. of this D3 brain boundary condition. Okay, D3 is at the, at the boundary. I mean, it's, it's circle, you mean? I mean, so this is the world sheet. The topology of the world sheet is just a disk. Yeah. So the boundary condition that you impose on the disk boundary okay. is that of one of these D3 brains. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let, let me try to explain why um, this kind of one point functions can give rise to non trivial profiles for the fields. So uh, it's essentially a simple idea that you can see from a field theoretic picture. If you have a source, some, some source G of X for my scalar field phi, let's say, which is an open three field, then essentially you're saying that the equation is modified. The equation of motion is not just box phi equals zero, but box phi equals the source. And so if you want to understand the effect, the feedback of the source on the profile of the, of the field, you just do a Fourier transform. Okay, so, so, so this, this computation, this, this sort of, uh, this computation in the presence of this background is interpreted as sort of the, um, the source in momentum space. So instead of JFX, we compute from string theory this, this J of K, and all, all we do is to compute the profile is to just compute the inverse Fourier transform. And as we'll see, computing this correlator from the world shape point of view, we'll get some momentum dependent factor as the, as, the, as the source, and doing this Fourier transform exactly reproduces the profiles of the Google written defect. Okay, so I hope the um, basic idea is clear about how we, 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 we hope to reproduce the profiles for the defect from string perturbation. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Okay, if not, let me, let me, let me go on. So I want to make a comment that this is not a sort of a radical new idea. This is the same sort of uh, philosophy was used by my collaborators in the past, at least on a couple of occasions, uh, to great effect. So the, the, the first example of this where, was when they used the boundary state formalism to compute the leading correction to the sort of P brain profile. So when you consider the D brain as a supergravity soliton, then that has some profiles for the uh, supergravity fields and they could compute the leading correction to this profile in supergravity exactly the same way that they, they, they used the boundary state that corresponds to the deep brain and they inserted the uh, vortex operator for the closed string field whose profile you want to compute and they, they, they got the leading correction to this profile. More interestingly and more relevant for our case, the same idea was used by them to recover the uh, sort of the classical gauge instance solution from world sheet perturbation theory, where they, they, they use a sort of particular open closed uh, disk as a source for the D3 brain gauge field. So all of the examples are sort of the same idea that there is some uh, world sheet which acts as a source for an open string or a closed string field in the, in the first case. And once you have the source, which you compute by this non-trivial world sheet calculation, you just use the basic field theoretic ideas and record the profile by doing an inverse Fourier transform. Okay. The only thing that changes is what is the relevant world sheet that acts as a source for the uh, profile you're interested in. Uh, in, in. In our example, which is the surface defect, the, the world sheet that acts as a source is a, is a simple disk with one insertion of the twisted closed string field. Okay. All right, so let me, let me try to now uh, get into the details. So what, what we compute is, uh, as I said, an open closed correlator, one closed string field, one open string field in the presence of a particular D3 brain. And so what we need is the spectrum of twisted closed string states of the obifold. Uh, this is a very well studied problem from the mid to early, early 90s. Uh, so what, what I'll, I'll still, make a review of, the, of, of how these spectrum can be, can be obtained using CFT methods. Uh, the next thing we need is sort of 
what the boundary state does to the closed string field. And this is, this is encapsulated in what are called reflection rules. So the, the, the right movers are sort of reflected by the presence of the boundary. And lastly, what we need is a spectrum of open string state for these D brains that are extended along the obifold partially. So this is going to be uh, new results. And I, I, I don't think this uh, is there in the previous literature. And finally, we'll put these things together, compute the open closed couplings using standard superstring perturbation theory and compute the profiles, okay? That's the plan. Uh, if there are no more questions, I will uh, proceed with the uh, closed string spectrum. I have a question. Uh, so you wrote a, like a B sub B, right? B sub yes. B four four. Yeah. So so you connect this alpha beta uh, gamma eta to this B. The exactly. Year exactly. Later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in, instead of computing propagating modes, we give uh -huh. a, a particular constant background expectation value to these closed string schemes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And those will act as the alpha beta gamma. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so now we go on to the, so, so the sort of the overview is done and what I'll do is to uh, go to the technical details. I'll explain the closed string spectrum, uh, briefly mention the reflection rules and then go on to the open string spectrum, okay? So this, this uh, strings on ALE spaces have been well studied ever since the mid nineties uh, and Selmi et al have a very nice discussion from both the geometric as well as worksheet point of view. But if you look at the Douglas Moore paper in sort of half a page, they are going to list all the things that I'm going to say in the next three or four transparencies. So for the experts, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to take it slow and sort of explain how, what the spectrum is going to be like. Uh, good. So the isometry of C2, of C2 times C3 is, is SO4, of course. And you can write that as SU2 plus times SU2 minus. And the orbifold, which I'll take it to be the simplest case of Z2 for the rest of the talk, is embedded in one of these SU2s. So the unbroken uh, isometry is essentially one SU2. And we'll see that all the closed string um, fields will be representations of the SU2. So you'll find, you know, spin half, triplets, singlets, and so on. And all, all of those refer to these uh, representations of this unbroken SU2, okay? So because of the orbifold, in the bosonic sector, uh, you have twisted sectors, of course, and the ground state is not the usual sector vacuum, but it's created by this twist operator. And this two twist operator has dimension a quarter for these bosonic fields. Similarly, for the fermions, usually in the NS sector, you have a single vacuum. And in the Ramon sector, you have these uh, spin fields that generate the degenerate vacuum. But again, because of the orbifold in the two and three directions, the NS sector have zero modes and the Ramon sector don't have, does not have the zero modes. So, what happens uh, is that the, if you want to write the vertex operators down, you essentially have decoupled CFTs, you know, the bosonic sector, the fermionic sector, the super ghosts, the ghosts, and so on. So let me just briefly say in words what these uh, um, fields are going to look like. So the boson, like I said, is going to have a twist sector ground state always. In the fermionic case, you have spin fields in both the NS sector and the Raman sector. It's the difference being that in the, in, in the NS sector, you have, you have the spin fields that are spin as by SO4. And for um, uh, the Ramon sector, you have spin fields of SO6. Now, as I said at the beginning, we will not consider propagating modes. So what we'll do is to set the momenta to zero for these closed string modes and just set constant background values for these uh, twisted scalars. And uh, lastly, the super ghost will have this factor e to the minus L5. Uh, depending on what picture you are. So the canonical picture is gonna be minus one for the uh, NS sector and minus half or minus three halves for the um, Ramon sector. Okay. So this is sort of a brief uh, two minute crash course on, <laughs> on this super string world sheet spectrum. I'm sorry about that. But let me just tell you what the NS sector phase look like. So the NS sector vertex operators essentially look like follows. So these S alpha are these spin fields, just spin as a SO4. Uh, I'm in the minus one picture, and this delta is the um, twist sector ground states that, that I mentioned earlier. You can check that these are conformal dimension one and have an exactly analogous uh, field for the right moves. So you see, this, this is what I meant by saying that these are all uh, representations of the unbroken institutes. So this is a spin half representation. Okay. So the closed string states are obtained by combining uh, left with right. 
so you essentially have a tensor product of a half comma zero times half comma zero. Uh, so you have a singlet field and a triplet field here. So the, these are the four scalars in my NS sector that are in the preset sector. Okay, so they, 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 they transform into representations of the isometric. That's what I just said. Now, the Ramon sector is very similar, except that I have two changes. One is that the spin field is now a spin of SO6, and the um, super go sector is now in the canonical uh, picture of minus half or minus three half, depending on, I mean, since I'm in the Ramon sector. Okay. Now, the chirality of these uh, uh, states are correlated with the picture number and that follows from GSO. And so I'm just going very briefly through this. I mean, if you don't uh, too familiar with the data, it's, it's okay. I just want to say that the closed strings can be explicitly written down. And in the Ramon sector, we'll work in this asymmetric super ghost picture uh, because then uh, what we get are the potentials. So the, these are the Ramon Ramon potentials that arise in the twisted sectors. Uh, and I'm in the twisted sector, you can see, because the bosonic ground states has the twist sector ground state. Okay. So I have a single scalar field C from the Ramon sector and this two form potential CMN uh, from the, uh, so a total of 16 states are there because yeah, four times four, four from the left, four from the right, you get 16 and they break up into a scalar and a two form. Okay. So from the inner sector side, we had four closed string scalars. For the Ramon sector, we have one scalar and a two form. Is, is, this, is this part clear? At least the final result. I have a question in previous slides. Yeah. Uh, when you say this B and a B, B is a real scalar, B, C is some triplet of, I mean, exactly. it takes the, a value yes. of R, 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 to R, R cube or something, right? Sorry, the, the take? B, B, B is the, uh, takes a value of real number, right? B is a real number, yes. So but B is a real right, field. Right hand side, what is the, Information. Yeah, so in plain principle, as, as you're saying, so I, I just have a new B here. What I'll do is to multiply this by a B here, an explicit B here. Okay. When I compute the correlator, I, I'll just denote by B. I, I, I have not written the polarization here. That's what you're wondering. Oh, okay. Okay. I see. Okay. I'll multiply this by a, a, a real number B afterwards. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is so that so much for the closed string sector, and now we want to add D brains. And I want to remind you that the D brains are a sort of a partially extended along the orbifold. So what happens is the isometry is broken again. You don't have an SU2 anymore, you just have an SO2 because of the presence of the D brain. And so what happens is all these closed string fields are further decomposed into just scalars. So you don't no longer have a triplet the triplet breaks up into a complex uh, doublet. I mean, I mean, just four scalars, which we denote B, sorry, B prime and B plus minus. So these are just, so earlier we had a tau C, and now I'm just putting in the explicit uh, six sigma matrix, I mean, the Pauli matrix uh, tau three or tau plus or tau minus. So B plus and B minus are complex conjugates of each other, and B and B prime are two real scalars. And the same way from the Ramon sector, apart from C, we also get another scalar, because of this breaking of the isometry, uh, which is this gamma one two part of what used to be the two form Ramon Ramon field from the twisted sector. So in total, we have now six scalars. And I want to remind you that in the Gukov Witten picture, we only had four sort of scalars we want to reproduce with alpha, beta, gamma, eta. But now from this closed string picture, we have six scalars that could potentially uh, be a source for the open string fields. Okay? Four from the NS sector and uh, two from the Ramon Ramon sector. So this, this uh, is, is the um, summary of the closed string fields that are there in the um, orbifold theory and which are scalars in the twisted sectors. Okay. Good, so now uh, just, I just want to briefly mention uh, without going into any, any detail, the additional information that the boundary set provides so what we're interested in, if you recall, is this uh, disk one point function with one open to one closed insertion. If you map it using the conformal transmission, the upper half plane, we have an upper half plane with one insertion on the boundary of the upper half plane and one bulk insertion. Okay. So the way to do this computation is to, is to reflect, you know, to use the doubling trick and to reflect the closed string field and finally have, uh, you know, three insertions 
in the complex plane. And this is effectively equivalent to a three point function of open string fields, essentially. Okay. So that, that, that data of how to do this is encoded, sorry, is, is, is encoded in the boundary state. So the boundary state essentially encodes the couplings of the closed string fields with the debris. Okay. So essentially it encodes the one point functions of all the closed string fields in the presence of the, of the D-brain, essentially what its source is. And the fractional brains that we're interested in are labeled by the irreducible representations of the Obifold group. This is what Douglas and Moore taught us in, back in the mid nineties. So for Z2, there are two types of fractional brains and they only differ in the sign that appears in front of the twisted sector part of the boundary state. That's all. So Z2 is really simple. We just have uh, the, the Cardi state to be the, some untwisted part plus the twisted part or the untwisted plus part minus the, the twist sector. Okay. So that is, so, so for this case, we have explicitly the boundary state in our paper, or in fact, this boundary state was already written in the mid nineties or maybe in the early two thousands by, I should have mentioned it here. I'm sorry about that, by the back here. Marotta and Bertolini. So you can use the explicit form of the boundary state to, uh, to infer how the closed string fields are affected by the presence of the boundary. Okay? So that they tell you exactly what the reflection rules are for the closed string field. Okay? So how, how the right movers are reflected onto the left movers by the presence of the boundary. And it's particularly simple for us because all the states we're interested in are the ground states of the twisted sectors. Okay, they are all generated by spin fields and so on. So all you really need is the zero mod part of the boundary state. And that encodes the information about these, re about these reflection rules. Okay. So I've just given you the answer. I haven't gone through the details because it's not really, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna take us way off course. But uh, the bottom line is that we have, uh, that this closing spectrum is completely known in the twisted sector. And for these particular D-brains, these fractional brains, we know the, the effect that the boundary has on the closed string states. Okay. So the only thing now left to do is to construct the open string spectrum, and then we can compute these uh, sources. Okay. Good. I, if there are any questions, it's a good moment to, to talk about this. Otherwise, uh, I can, I'll move on to the open strings. Are you considering some effect of B-field? Yeah, so you see, I'm, I'm in this orbifold picture. Yeah. Where the, the spectrum in the twist sector is exactly what I just told you. Uh -huh. At the end, I'll tell you what these states are in a more geometric setting. Okay. So when the orbifold is blown up, it becomes an ALE, a smooth ALE space. Yes. And then we'll see that these fields that I mentioned have an interpretation in terms of geometric and B field moduli. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. So that I'll come to the end. But at, at the moment, you know, just a purely or before CFT computation, what is the spectrum, you know, what is boundary state, what are the reflection rules and so on. Okay, but, but I mean, the worksheet, I mean, action has a B field, right? But not this, so, so, so here we're using this exact or before uh, CFT description. Okay. It, it, it you know, it, it knows about all that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, good. I mean, I'm, I'm not using a Sigma model description, I'm using an exact or before description, so. So it's sort of included inside. Okay, very good. Uh, so now, good. So now let me go, go on to the open strings and this is really the uh, part of the new part of the story. So for usually when you consider d and orbifolds, uh, this is what Douglas and Moore did. You have, you have to find out what is the spectrum of open strings that are left invariant under the orbifold action. And the orbifold acts not only on the oscillators of the world sheet modes, they, they, they also act on the chat pattern factors. Okay, so you, you look at the combination of these oscillators and chat pattern factors, and you look at the spectrum that is left invariant by the orbifold. But for these orbifolds that we are considering, see the D-brain extends along the orbifold as well. So we have an additional factor because momentum modes now also carry charges under the orbifold action. So in fact, we have oscillators, chat pattern factors, and momentum factors, and you can, See that by the simple, the Z, simple Z2 example. See, usually if you want to construct what is operators, you would just write e to the i k x. 
right? But that is not immediate under the orbifold action if you consider momenta along directions that are along the orbifold. So what you have to do is to use either cosine or sine functions, and these are either even or odd under the orbifold action. Okay. And more generally, for the ZM case, you will have to consider some not some complicated uh, combinations of plane waves that transform covariantly under the action, under the action of the orbifold. So in addition to the oscillators and chan pattern factors, we also have to consider momentum ones. That is the only new thing. So the net result is that uh, there is no open string to say that is projected out if it carries momentum transverse to the, I mean, momentum along the orbifold. See? And this is precisely why we can interpret this theory as a defect with n equals four itself. So if you had, if you had a brain, if you had a, a deep brain transfers to the orbifold, you usually typically will, will break some of the supersymmetries in a sort of obvious way because some modes will be absent. Whereas here what's happening is that the, the, the bulk mode, so to speak, that is the modes that are of the gauge field which carry momentum along the orbifold are still there. Okay? And this is also evident if you compute the one loop partition function, which is what uh, Dibek, Bertoli, and Marotta did. And they find a decoupled 2D and 4D sector. So, so it's very clear that, that this setup is, is, is like having a defect in the presence of an n equals 4 theory. Okay? Uh, and now let, let's recall that this is the uh, computation that we want to do, this, this computation. So there is no other boundary insertion apart from a single one. So all we want really are vertex operators for open strings that have diagonal chain pattern factors. Okay? So we will never consider modes in, in, in this paper, at least we will in this work, we will never consider modes that you know, go between different types of fractional brains. So we'll only consider open string citations for uh, um, between fractional brains of the same type. Okay. So let's try to see how to construct those kind of vertex operators. And let me, let me recall for you what you would do uh, in the usual case. So usually if you had a deep brain, you would just consider vertex operators like so. You will just consider um, you know, psi mu or psi a in the minus one picture with some momentum e to the ikx. And we can write the same uh, uh, mode in a different picture, in the zero picture, by acting with a picture changing operator. And you'll get something of, of, the, of this form. You see, now what happens is that if you are, if you have indices that are transverse to the orbifold, then you don't have just e to the ikx, you have this cosine function because the combination is not invariant under the orbifold. In the same way, if you consider uh, oscillators that are along the orbifold, so this perpendicular direction, remember, is the direction that is in common to both the d-brain and the orbifold, then it is this combination that is um, invariant under the orbifold. So you see that already in the minus one picture, uh, things look very different for the vertex operator. So it's exactly the same mode, but the vertex operator is uh, written like so. And if you want the vertex operators in a different picture, you can just act on these with the picture changing operator and find those operators. This is, this is what we do. Uh, so are, are, there, are there any questions here? What do you mean diagonal champaron factor? What I mean is that, um, you see here, if, uh -huh. if I had another insertion, okay. I could in principle have a, a mode that goes between i, j, and then use the other insertion to go back from j to i. Mm -hmm. Right, because there are two, in the z2 or before, there are two kinds of d-brains. Yes. So here I mean that I only have a single type of boundary condition. Mm -hmm. So this, this mode should ah, have I a see. sort of an I, an I, I channel. I see, I see, okay. That's fine. So that, that's why I, I never discuss any, any act, action on chan pattern factors because it's always diagonal. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. Uh, now the closed string operators that I showed you earlier are, are all in the minus one picture. So already, from that, we have a total picture number to be minus two, which is what we need for a non-trivial, uh, non-zero co-correlation function. So we need the, um, the open string operators in the zero picture. So I just act on this with the picture changing operator and take my word for it that it, you, you get something that looks like this. And you can check that each term by itself is invariant under the orbifold. Whenever you have a psi perpendicular, it comes with a sine function. When you have a side parallel, it comes with the cosine function and so on. Okay, so 
we can write the same set of vertex operators, similar vertex operators for also the three complex scales. See? So if you, if you had considered a completely transverse deep brain, you would not have find, you would not have found, you know, three complex scalars, but now we actually find three complex scalars. And in, in, our, in our paper, we, we, we have the vertex operators for all those as well. Okay, so here I've written these gauge fields in a sort of complex notation. So remember that W and W bar are the, this is the complex direction along the defect and ZZ bar are the directions um, perpendicular to the defect, but also along the deep end. Okay, so, so now we have everything in place. We have all the vertex operators, you know, all, all, uh, the closed string, the open string. We have the, we have the reflection rules. So all we have to do is to compute this three point four. Sorry, I just want to understand the notation. What is minus one, minus one picture and zero picture? What do you mean? Good, so if I, so this is the, the coefficient of the super ghost is the picture number. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. So the, for a non-zero correlator on the disc, you uh -huh. need minus two total picture number. All the vertex operators, the pictures have to add up to minus two. Mm -hmm. So here I have, uh, I've already chosen the closed string fields in the minus one, minus one picture. Mm -hmm. So that already uh, saturates the background charge for the super ghost. So mm -hmm. then I have to use the zero picture for the- Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so what we have to do is to compute this disk correlator and uh, use the, I mean, this, this, this integral and division by the projective volume, essentially you can think of it as the presence of three C ghosts that takes away the, uh, because the disc has the SL to R isometry, you have conformal clean vectors there. So you have to take away that uh, degrees of freedom. And this, this is essentially just a compact way to write that. So, these are my operators. I see now this, this, uh, this is uh, something that Satish mentioned earlier. I'm now inserting an explicit background field B, background value B for the closed string field, right? So this is my closed string operator. That's my open string operator. I'm just considering it as an example, the gauge field in the uh, perpendicular directions to the defect. And all I have to do is to just compute the three point function. Okay. And the first thing I do is to use the reflection rule and write this as uh, essentially a three point function on a disk. Okay. And this essentially boils down to just decoupled uh, computations in several free theories. So I have the free bosonic sector, free fermionic sector, super ghost, all of these. And essentially, these are the basic correlators we use. The super, co co super ghost correlator gives me a simple pole. The, one point function of this uh, open string field gives me a delta function along, along the defect. This is gonna be really important for us. And all of these are just standard uh, correlation functions in super string perturbation theory. And the final result is just this, see? And you can recognize this, uh, this factor to be exactly the factor that you would get if you included the C ghost correlators, that the three C ghost correlators did exactly this. So from this three point CFT correlator, one can extract the string amplitude. And this is the sort of one point function, if you wish, for the open strings in the presence of all possible excitations turned on. So I've just summarized the non zero ones. You know, we've computed, we computed all of the other uh, the fields as well. So you, instead of B, we put B plus, B minus, you know, C, C prime, and all of these fields for all of the fields. And only these three and the complex conjugates are non-zero. Okay. So let, let, let me make, it, make, it, make a few remarks about this answer. So there's always a momentum conserving delta function along the defect, which is expected because there is Poincare invariance along the defect. But there is a non-trivial uh, profile here for the, this non-trivial dependence on the momenta in the directions transverse to the defect, but again, along the debris and along the object. Okay. That's, that's one remark. The second remark is that the, you remember we had six scalars. We had four from the NS sector and two from the Ramon Ramon sector. Two of those scalars don't compare to this D brain at all. So the, the two fields are not B prime and C prime. They give zero correlators to all of these open string fields. So out of these six closed string fields, only four of them give uh, uh, in coupled non-trivially to the open string fields. 
Okay. Yeah, Satoshi, you have a, you have a question? Yeah, uh, no, no, no additional question. W yes. What is the Kappa 2, Kappa 1? Yes, good. so ka Kappa 2, Kappa 1, and so on are the complex momenta. Okay. So I've, you always use complex direction. So this is essentially K3 plus IK4. Oh, okay. I so see, if I, I see. Because, you know, this, this field A2 is the complex component of the, of the gauge field. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so I see. it comes about it. Sorry, how, about yeah, B, yeah. how about B prime and C prime? So those, if I can, can I just, what, sorry what? to flip back. Yeah. yeah, so let me just go back a moment to the spectrum of the closed string theory. You see, B prime and C prime are these scalars. So you okay. see, in the sector had four scalars, a similar to the triplet. Uh -huh. And that became, after the D prime was introduced, just four scales. Okay. So it's the sort of the, the, the third component of what used to be the triplet. Uh-huh, I see. Okay, so these two guys don't couple to the D-brains, mm -hmm. to the, to, at least to these open strings in the presence of these D-brains, but the mm -hmm. other four do. So if you okay. compute the correlate, you, you just find zero for B, B prime and C prime, mm -hmm. and those values what I just told you. Oh, I see. Um, very stupid question. So this mm -hmm. B and C are not related to B, C goals, right? No, no, no. No, 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 right? No, 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 right. okay, no these, okay. these, these, just, these just are the real number, right? The, these are real numbers. Okay, okay, okay. And they are the background values okay. for these particular twisted okay. scalars in the NSNS and Ramon Ramon uh, okay. okay, sectors. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we have this final result. And you see, this is what we said was the Fourier transform of the source for the open string field. Okay, so let, let me recall for you what we said earlier that if you had a profile, if you had a source for the open string field, then you get an equation of the sort because these are all massless fields. So you had box phi equals the source. And what we just computed is this uh, Fourier transform of the source in momentum space. So if you want to find the effect of the source on the open string field, all you have to do is to Fourier transform by attaching a propagator. Okay. So now notice that all of these uh, sources that we have have a delta function along the defect. So essentially what happens is, although you have a four dimensional D brain, right? The momentum integral is essentially two dimensional, only along the, only including the momenta in the transverse directions. The transverse of the defect, but along the orbit. Okay? And they're all proportional to either kappa two or its complex conjugate. So essentially, I'm just getting it schematically here. If you do this for Fourier transform for this particular coupling, what you find is a simple pole. Okay, because without this kappa two, it's essentially the Fourier transform of the propagator, which in two dimensions is just the log function. So we just have one kappa two, so one derivative, we get the simple pole. So you see in this elementary way how simple poles arise. So now if you put in all the factors of i and four pi and two pi and everything, what we find is that for the i to d brain, the profile of the uh, gauge field in the transverse directions give me this factor, one by z bar times this coefficient b. Okay, and if you use uh, combined with the complex conjugate, you should recognize that this is exactly the kuka witten um, uh, profile for the transverse uh, gauge field. In exactly the same way, if you do it for the scalar, we find one by z. So now we take uh, n naught stacks of the, the first type and one stack of the second type for a u n naught plus u n one gauge theory. And we find this profile for the gauge field and the scale. So this is exactly reproducing uh, the singular profiles of the defect uh, for a Google written uh, defect of type, you know, n naught n one. So it's a partition of n into exactly two pieces. Okay, uh, any questions at this point? Good, so then let me go on to the one remaining uh, parameter, which was the two dimensional theta term, if you remember. So the, 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 what, the one thing we didn't discuss was the, was the coupling to the ramon ramon scalar. And at the outset, it looks a bit odd because we have a delta function along the parallel directions, the defect directions, and the coefficient is kappa one. So it looks like this should be zero, okay? So indeed, there is no 
source for the A parallel field. So for the gauge field along the defect, there is indeed no source. However, this coupling does indicate a non-trivial interaction for the defect theory. And that you can see if I just put back in the uh, polarization for this open string field. So if you, combine, if you make this combination, A1 bar with the vertex and A1 with the A bar vertex, what you find is exactly the field strength on the right hand side. So this is exactly the field strength in momentum space. So you see, if you had a non-trivial field strength along the world volume, okay, then that is what this coupling is referring to. Although it looks like as zero as far as the source is concerned, it is indeed telling me that there is a non-trivial two-dimensional coupling along the defect. And the two-dimensional coupling just comes once you Fourier transform to real space, as, as I've just shown you here. So it's essentially the coupling to the Ramon-Ramon scalar is, uh, is indicating a topological term on the defect world. Okay. So exponentiating this, this, this interaction term, essential term in the action, what we are saying is that for non-zero background value for the RR scalar, one really has a coupling on the defect theory, which is exactly what we'd expect for the Ferrago Covington defect. Okay. So our final um, uh, conclusion is that the alpha, beta, gamma, eta parameters are identified with the background values for two-set scalars in the NSNS and the Ramon Ramon circuit, okay? with exactly these uh, coefficients. Okay, so let, let me now finally try to give you one piece of evidence for why we think this is the uh, right proposal. And that has to do with consistency with SD and it's related to something that Satoshi asked earlier. Now the orbifold background is essentially the zero size limit of a smooth ALE space. And, from, and, and it's sort of well known from this uh, paper of Enselby et al. and even probably earlier from the early 90s that the scalars in the twisted uh, sectors can be given a geometric or a B field moduli interpretation as follows. That the, the B and C field that I mentioned are exactly integrals of the, excuse me, of the NSNS and Ramon Ramon two form fields over the, uh, the non trivial cycle of the blown up ALE space. Okay, so if you combine this with our earlier identification here, what we find is that the alpha and eta are essentially integrals of the B and C fields of the type 2B supergravity theory now over the non trivial two cycles of the. Z2 space of the blown up Z2 geometry. And it is well known that uh, type 2B super, type 2B subgravity has uh, you know, an SL2Z uh, S duality. And this is exactly the, the transmission properties of the B and C fields under the SL2Z transformation. And if you go through the details, you'll find that uh, we, re we reproduce exactly the SL2Z transmission that uh, Gugo Witten proposed for the alpha and eta parameters. So here, the S duality is inherited from the parent type to be supergravity theory. Okay, and that's also exactly how the SL2Z of the D3 brain theory uh, is inherited from the type to be supergravity. Okay. And the, the B plus minus uh, similarly are, are complex structure model of the ALE space. So they are metric deformations and the string frame metric uh, is rescaled like so. And that's exactly how the beta gamma parameters are rescaled. So we feel that this is sort of strong evidence that our identification of the continuous parameters of the surface defect with these background parameters in the closed string theory uh, sort of makes sense. It all holds together. And uh, this is what it is for the Z2 case. So I, I have a few minutes left, Satoshi, yes? Yes, yes, of course, please okay. go. Okay, good. Okay, so then let, let me make a few remarks about what happens for the generic defect. So this is what we did in our second paper. Uh, so the first thing to mention is that the gener by a generic defect, I mean the partition uh, is generic. I have some M uh, blocks in the profiles of the gauge field and the scalars and so on. So I have four M continuous parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, eta. And then here we consider fractional rebrains on a ZM or before. Okay, so the ideas, the conceptual ideas are exactly the same. They go through the same way as in the Z2 case, but uh, you know, it's sort of much more complicated. The closing spectrum is uh, very complicated. Uh, the open strings are similarly more complicated. Sine and cos functions are replaced by those combinations of plane waves I, I showed. 
I showed, etc. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, the concept that I goes through exactly, and the final identification is exactly as follows. So the alpha parameter is some combination of the, the B parameters. Now note that the twisted sectors are labeled by conjugacy classes, which are these A's, and the fractional brains are labeled by the irreducible representations of ZM. Those are the I's. Now there's a natural sort of change of basis between these two. It was, they were proportional for the Z2 case because they're a single twisted sector. But uh, in the generic case, the map is more complicated and there are similar formulas for beta, gamma, and eta with the uh, singlet B replaced by the other uh, background values for the maps. Okay, so I, I, hope this, I hope it's clear that the same thing can be done, but with more technical muscle, essentially. Okay, so I think I'm done. Let me just uh, end by saying that, uh, so we've sort of uh, done what we set out to do, which is geometrically engineer a gauge theory defect using D3 brains on a ZM orbifold in type 2B string theory. And the main lesson we learned was that the Kanuta Chikawa orbifold construction works exactly as they envisioned it, uh, except that we have added this small um, detail that the um, continuous parameters of the defect are encoded in the background values for the uh, orbifold. So that, that's the additional data. And, and that with this information, we could recover the singular profiles of the gaze theory and also the 2D the theta term. I think the more, more, more uh, interesting or exciting thing is the fact that this whole type to be set up gives us a, a solid uh, sort of framework, uh, a sort of perturbative super string theory framework where you can ask questions about defects and maybe you can answer them using string theory. You know, and maybe the setup can, can help you to ask questions that you would not ask in the purely gaseatic framework, who knows? You know, because you can consider many kinds of D-brains, uh, different configurations. So yeah, I think there's a lot to explore in this setup. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? If you have a question, uh, Turn on the microphone. Um, okay, let, let me ask one question. So um, there's a work by asking all in the company that the uh, B field um, at the orbital point is some fraction one over, for instance, Z, C2 or Z2 case, uh, B field on the, um, how to say, zero size limit of this really orbital limit, B field yes. flux has to be one half. That's true. Um, so does it mean that the alpha has to be always one half in this case? So in, in few few slides back, you mentioned that the alpha is, mm -hmm. uh, so sorry, B, B is equal to yeah, integral yeah, of B, uh, B few, right? This one, yeah. So this, right, so this, this, this was just to, this was just to, uh, mm -hmm. to infer the, I mean, if I just, the before the point, it's hard to understand how Mm -hmm. to uh, how to understand how this uh, twisted sector field will transform into S duality. Mm -hmm. So to make contact with that, we sort of use the geometric intuition that comes from so super gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're saying that... Uh, so since you relate to small b is integral of uh, this b field, right? Yes, yes. Since like yes. Aspen will, uh, and the company will tell us like uh, this small b has to be one half, in the zero size limit uh, of LA space. I'm not sure if it is true, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Probably it is. But here we're trying to understand, yeah. you know, if you're trying to understand uh, how, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to, so the, the question here is if I want to um, see a Gukko with a defect mm -hmm. with alpha, beta, gamma, mm -hmm. what do I have to do on the string theory side? Oh, I see. Okay. Right? And, and then we say that what we have to do is to turn on these. Uh, Close string fields, and then on the on the, on the gauge theory side, I would see, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the alpha beta gamma of the parameters. I see. I'm okay. not saying anything about the consistency of the closed string theory per se. Uh huh. Okay. So I'm just okay. using them as model I fields. I see. Yeah, but there is some like a work by mathematician in, in Indra New Vistas. Uh huh. At the TFR. Yes. He. Yes. Somehow interpret this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, he, he's working on this mathematical aspect of this Google Witten defect. And I somehow, see. by using some 
stability on some alpha can be tuned to some fractional number and so on. That, that's what I. Uh, um, oh, you're saying there are independent mathematical reasons for saying yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, that justified as I'm asking all the results. And so I, I, that's what I thought. But anyway, maybe yeah. I'm, no, maybe sorry, I'm I, wrong. I, I, I don't, don't, yeah. Okay. okay. I, I don't have anything to, to say about that, that, that at the moment, yeah. Any other questions? Or comments? Also welcome. Comments. How about for the n equal 2 instead of n equal 4? Ah, so those can be incorporated by doing another orbifold. So uh, let me show you this picture I had. Uh, right. So imagine two more planes, right? Uh -huh. Yep. And then I would do an orbifold along three and four, let's say. Yeah. So those would get rid of some of the scalars. Uh huh. So in particular, this phi scalar whose profile I just I just uh, yeah. wrote down, uh -huh. that would be projected out. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so that, that won't be there, but alpha will be there just as here, uh -huh. and uh, eta will be there just, just as earlier. Uh -huh. uh, so you just, you just have to redo the computation with an extra close to an orbifold. But can you do some Gaiato construction like a uh, Riemann surface times R4, but how do you interpret this orbifold in, <laughs> yeah. in, in, in class S? And do you have some string theory, theoretical picture for this orbifolding? In no, I, 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 that's, a good, that's a good question. I, I don't know how to relate that continuously to this. Okay. I don't even know if they are the same type of defect. Uh, uh -huh. you know, there are those, from the 60 perspective, there are these uh, what you mentioned two, what you mentioned four type of defects, they are different. Uh -huh. So I don't know if that is related to this question you're asking right now or not. Um, yeah, but we just wanted a framework where, you know, we can use perturbative string theory, Walshi techniques. Uh -huh. uh, since okay. there's so much literature on boundary states and open string scattering and so on. So we thought it would be nice to have this. Uh, and also, we want to understand Kanadachi Ava better. We want to yeah. understand why that, that, that construction worked. So okay. I'm hoping this, this gives some little insight to that. Yeah. I see. Any questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Whatever I messed up. <laughs> uh, next week, <laughs> next week, Marcus uh, in the audience will tell us about some uh, Higgs branch and so on. Okay, great. <laughs> the same time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I usually listen to the talks that are recorded because 12.30 India time is lunch time for me, so usually I, I, can't, I cannot be there live. Okay, okay. Maybe, maybe That's the problems usually. So.